Today, I'm speaking with Brady Goodwin. Brady, thank you so much for joining me today. It's a pleasure, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we've been trying to do this for a while. I'm glad I finally yeah. get the chance to uh, talk to you. And I've seen a bunch of your other recent interviews. So uh, it's awesome that you're getting around to a lot of different channels. Mm. And just for everyone that doesn't know Brady yet, um, please do um, get to know him by liking and subscribing to his channel. I'll have his link beneath our video. But he is a formerly Christian rapper uh, nominated for a Grammy twice. Mm. And he's known as Fanatic. And he was part of the group called The Cross Movement. Uh, he's also an author. He's published six books so far, if I'm correct, including the book Let There Be Gaslight, which is an absolutely amazing title. Mm. Uh, he's also a teacher. He's currently teaching uh, hip hop history and ethics, a course he developed at the Community College of Philadelphia. Mm. He previously taught apologetics and courses on Christianity and culture at Lancaster Bible College and sociology of hip hop at the Evangelical Karen University in Philadelphia, which used to be known as um, uh, PCB, right? Philadelphia College yep. of the Bible and then exactly. Philadelphia Biblical University. Mm -hmm. He earned his bachelor's from Lancaster Bible College in 2009. I was uh, earned mine as well from there exactly 10 years earlier, wow. 1999. So showing my age here. Mm -hmm. And a Master of Arts in Religion from Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia in 2015. So that's what we know about you so far. Yeah. Can you clarify anything I got wrong there, add to it, and also tell us just something fun about yourself that's not related to your work? <laughs> uh, yeah, so I think you pretty much, that that's a good bio there. Um, born and raised in Philadelphia, uh, only ever lived outside of Philadelphia for a brief period when I was in Lancaster, but from the time I was about 17 to maybe 30, I spent most of my life on the road uh, traveling with the cross movement, so in hotels and hostels and uh going overseas uh so spent a lot of my life on the road uh mm -hmm. and then around age 30 kind of planted some roots down in philadelphia back again so yeah and your role with the cross movement was you were more of the the lyricist is that right yeah so cross movement is a rap group was a rap group um with that that had five at the most i think maybe six strong lyricists uh so my role was a writer uh recording artist performer um, but we cross movement was three things. It was a record group, uh, a record label for profit, a uh, rap group, which was a partnership. And then it was a nonprofit uh, organization in Philadelphia. So I ran the nonprofit uh, cross movement ministries in Philadelphia for about maybe, I don't know, 12, 13 years as vice president of, of that ministry. So, um, yeah, I had several different roles with cross movement. Gotcha. Yeah. And going back to Philadelphia, um, I'm I'm from there too. I grew, grew up right outside the Philadelphia airport. What's your mm -hmm. favorite food from Philly? Uh, from Philly, I mean, we're only known food wise for cheese steaks and cream cheese. So yeah, <laughs> and, and, the, and the pretzels in the street, right? Oh, how about the yeah? We got the pretzel thing going on. But uh, yeah, I mean, you know, if you're in Philly, a good mushroom cheese steak is always going to be, you know, the thing you go to. So absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well, um. At this point, I'd love to uh, pass the ball to you, so to speak, and just uh, mm. hear your story. Um, I know mm. that you've been sharing it recently, so feel free to share some of the same things you've been sharing before. But if there's anything you've been that's been on your mind, I know sometimes when people get mm. a chance to share their stories, they end up kind of memories get triggered and some things mm. come out and they later reflect and there was some more levels, kind of like peeling back the onion. So if other stuff's come up since then, mm. feel free to share it. And I'll jump in probably with some questions here there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I'll just say, one, I appreciate you, Tim. I appreciate uh, your story. I shared your story on my uh, Facebook page, at least part of it, because uh, there's there are a few people who, when I hear their stories, I'm like, oh, man, I can relate. I can relate. And it's very similar to how, as a Christian, you know, when you would hear somebody's testimony, you like, oh, I remember that. I remember feeling that conviction or feeling that sense of contrition and, uh, you know, uh, you hear things in someone's testimony that makes you say, oh, so it's authentic. Mm -hmm. uh, but then on the, uh, surprisingly, as a deconverted Christian, it's the same thing. You hear someone deconvert and you're like, oh, you went through that too? And that happened next? Oh, I, I get it. So your story, uh, it, it resonated with me. And then I, I checked out your channel and saw, man, this guy's up to a, a great work here, just giving people a platform to tell their story. So I appreciate you, appreciate this opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, I, that. I really appreciate it. Yeah. That. Yeah, so um, my story is, uh, like I said, born and raised in Philadelphia. I always tell people I was raised in two places. I was raised in the streets of Philadelphia, and I was raised in church. So Monday through Thursday, I was, you know, your typical Philly kid, uh, raised in a single-parent home. My dad was about 20 minutes away in South Philly while we were in 
uh, section of the city called uh, Olney. Um, so I saw my dad once a week, but that kind of wasn't enough to, uh, well, I guess, I guess the, the absence of him on a regular basis led me to sort of being mentored by, you know, older guys around my way. And I don't mean like older men, like two or three years older, you, you have hair on your chin. Like that's enough to be like a, a father figure. Uh, and so from the time my, my parents split when I was 10, my friends instantly switched that summer from people my own age to people who were at least three or four years older than me. And um, so just learn ways from them, how to deal with women, how to deal with anger, how to deal with money. Um, it was a poor education, but it was education nonetheless. Uh, but that was Monday through Thursday, you know, running the streets, uh, going to school and trying to do as much of the same things in school as I was doing in the streets. So I'm cutting classes, I'm getting with the girls, I'm getting suspended, I'm making straight Fs on my report card. Um, but on the weekends, it was it was something of a different story because Friday night, Friday night it was youth group, Saturday it was church. What Sunday, denomination were you with? So a good question. The church was a non-denominational church, but now when I look back, it was pretty Pentecostal. Okay. Um, charismatic, you know, tongues and prophecies and and a little bit of prosperity, um, mm-hmm. prosperity gospel. Like when I when, once I left the church, that church, I should say, I left that church in 1995 for a more what I believe was a more Bible based uh, Christianity. And looking back at that from that vantage point, I realized how prosperity gospel oriented it, it actually was. It was basically TBN come to life uh, in the inner city. Um, Can I ask real quick, with yeah. your musical skills that came out later that we're going to eventually talk about, did you see some of that kind of flourishing in your childhood? Or would you have, if you were able to tell, go back in time and tell yourself as a child that you were going to be very musical, would you have been surprised as a kid or was that already part of your life? Uh, It was only a part of my life in that I was a consumer and a a connoisseur of rap. I would, you know, ride around around the city with the older guys, my older cousin, number one, and and then older guys in my neighborhood. And it's always rap music playing. And for whatever reason, I would, I guess this is common, I would memorize um, a lot of the music. I never tried to emulate it, never tried to do it, except for in the lunchroom playing around, you know, somebody's drumming on the table and we're cursing every other word, but no attempt to be skillful, to do it well. Um, So, no, I I think I would be surprised as a kid if someone said, you're going to be a rapper. It it wasn't in my my purview. I was uh, was content just to appreciate it as a listener. Mm. Um, So, yeah. You know, uh, Friday night youth group, Saturday choir rehearsal, and Sunday church. And I think that routine of Monday through Thursday, it's all me. Weekends, it's it wasn't really all God because I was going to church for the for my friends and the girls and the cultural aesthetics of it, not for the religious aspect. But some of the religious stuff was was seeping through. So even though I would hang around all the guys who sold drugs, I would never sell drugs. Um, I was hanging around the guys who would smoke weed, but I would never do that. I just felt like there are certain things I can't do. I was hanging around people who were carrying guns, but I could never carry a gun. The religious impetus sort of kept me from being, I guess I was, I was a, I was a, I was a good, bad kid or a bad good kid. I don't know. I was I was something where I just I couldn't I couldn't cross a certain line. Yeah. Um I Can prayed I every night. With your with your um home life, did your either or both of your parents bring, you know, spiritual stuff into it besides just taking you to church? Mom took us to church and I think she kind of trusted the youth group to do that job. There wasn't much like I would see my mother praying on her knees every morning. Okay, so and, it was very. Re- you saw a good example there, uh, so to speak. I don't know if I if I would even call it a good. Even to this day, <laughs> this might be fuel for someone to use against me and say, "See, you were never saved." But even when I became a very devout Christian, I still never developed the habits of praying every morning on my knees like my mother. I never looked at it as, "Look how devout and look how pious." I, it just that was her life. 
Yeah. And as bad uh, as bad of a good kid as I was becoming, I know she was praying for me every morning because I was getting worse and worse. Uh, my friends were starting to get arrested and I wasn't getting arrested, even though that eventually did happen. Um, I know she was praying for me every morning, but I never looked at her her lifestyle or her her routine as if I ever give God my life, I'll be doing that. It just that was just her. Yeah. yeah. But I guess maybe in the sense that it it does instill this idea that this is very real to some people, you know, where it's it's not just like, well, we go to church on Christmas and Easter. No, no, it was it was, it was like, definitely because mom was, <laughs> she added an extra day. No, I guess it was the same amount of days because my choir rehearsal was on Saturday. Hers was on Thursday nights. Okay. Um, so the adult choir was Thursday nights. Uh, so she was, she had some during the week church stuff happening too. And maybe she went on Wednesday nights for like the Bible study kind of things where we didn't do that either. But she wasn't a hypocrite. She wasn't like she was only pious in the morning when she prayed and only pious when she went to church, you know, we would be, if we were, if we're watching something, I guess this is a good question. I've never thought about this before. I think the way her faith showed up in the home, aside from praying every morning was she would try to regulate what we took in based on her Christian values. So if there's a movie where there's a sex scene, you yeah. know, we can't watch that. Or if they're cursing, we can't watch that. I remember one time she took one of my, uh, I forget what rap group it was. She took the tape and I think she broke it apart. Like, you know, you can't listen to that. I think it might've been the Beastie Boys or something like that way back in the day. Um, but it was the regulating what, you know, what we were taking in along, I don't know if I could say along Christian lines because I didn't know enough at that time to like, this is only a Bible thing, but you kind of got the sense of there's a God watching. Yeah. There's a there's a morality that you need to live by. But she would never really she, she wasn't the type to preach to us or, you know, have Bible study with us or anything like that. Right. So just implied. Yeah. 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 And um, but she was taking us to church. And then around age 12, it this the decision was kind of ours whether or not we were going to keep going. Did you hear a gospel invitation before then at all? I think I heard my first gospel presentation around age 12, but this was right around the time that she kind of left it up to us okay. because we had to travel about 40 yes. minutes across town to get to church, two or three buses in the cold some days. Oh, wow. And so she left it up to us if we were going to keep going. My sisters kind of like, uh, they stopped going, maybe went a little bit. I kept going one out of habit. And two, because like I said, my, my social circle was there. Gotcha. So even though I kept going, I was only going for the social circle. Around age 12, I responded to my first altar call. And I didn't understand what I was responding to. I think my, my initial response was, oh, wait, God's offering something? I don't want to be seen as saying no mm -hmm. to whatever God's offering. So I remember I went up. And responded because at least whatever this offer is, if it's from God, I said yes to it. I don't remember hell being a motivation. I don't remember the love of God being a motivation. It just was, you can't say no to God. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Um, yeah, and be foolish to do so. Yeah. And I think if I'm not mistaken, because I the kind of church it was, you could lose your salvation. I think I responded to several altar calls after that because I'm sure I, I messed up. And did so you actually I needed to. Fear, did you fear hell? I didn't fear hell as much as I feared. So it's very interesting what, what the motivation was for me to respond. I think I feared the disconnect. So maybe not hell, but just maybe it didn't work last time I got saved. Or if it did work, maybe it wore off. Or hmm. maybe I just need to do it again because I cursed or I slept with a girl. Or I need to do I need to do it again just to be sure kind of yeah. a thing. Mm -hmm. But once again, it still wasn't a hell thing. Like it wasn't like, Oh, I'm in danger of hell. Uh, that's a yeah. good thing. That's a good, yeah. I mean, for my, from where I'm sitting, that's awesome that you didn't have that fear. Cause right. for a lot of us, that's a huge fear. It's kind of a mixture of a bunch of things where you, mm -hmm. you feel like if you don't, you know, if you're not sure of your salvation, number one, it's hell, but number two, you mm -hmm. could also be 
effectively inviting demons to start to influence your life negatively. That's a good point. All yeah. kinds of other bad yeah. stuff. And it's like, um, just the fact that you didn't have fear of the literal flames of hell is, is a great. I mean, there's a lot of trauma yeah. there that you probably avoided. But I, I think there's another version of that, which is hell on earth. Hmm. And part of the fear could have been uh, the closest I can get back to something like that is if I'm angering this God, you know, Je you know Jesus is recorded as saying, uh, don't fear just the ones who could, you know, harm your body, but put your, your soul in hell. I was more worried about what could happen to me here in this life. Because I had had bullies, I had had, you know, uh, I've seen people go through things. That I'm like, I don't want to go through that. And if God is the one who can protect you from that, mm -hmm. why would I do something to piss that God off? So I think part of my wanting to get saved so much was not even about eternal life. It was about, I need help in this life. Yeah, I don't want to go through hell on earth. And God's the way to not have to deal with that. It's interesting that that's very, um, have you familiar with the term animism? Yes. It's a very animistic perspective in the sense that like tribal people, mm -hmm. when you go ask them, for example, um, why, why, if you have a big field of, of wheat mm -hmm. and you have these big sickles where you could cut it all down real quick, yeah. why don't why do you use your little, little teeny um, paring knife to cut them down real quietly and slowly? Mm. Well, because I might offend the, the, the God mm. of the field and he might hurt me, mm -hmm. you know, it might hurt me or, yeah. or whatever. And so they end up doing a lot of tribal people end up doing a lot of things to, Mm -hmm. either get the good gods to bless mm -hmm. them or the bad gods to ignore them right and or spirits i should say and that even though we, that's very you know really i've evident in tribal contexts mm -hmm. it's it actually is very prevalent in our world too we just do it yeah. differently whether it's something yeah. as simple as you know knock on wood it's like you know <laughs> do something to protect yourself right and exactly it's, it's really interesting how we do that to ourselves yeah yeah well i'm very big on it i think Christians don't like to say this, but it's a very, I think, innate and uh, organic idea to say there are forces in this life that I can't control. If I can come up with a middleman between me and those forces mm. that I can control, a talisman of some type, you know, and, and we don't like to think about God as someone that we're trying to control. But that's basically what we're doing when we're trying to behave and when we're trying to make sure we're on his good side, because he can control all the things I can't control. And I can kind of control him by getting on God's good side. You know what I mean? And, and you know, until you run into a, a, you know, a book like Job. But <laughs> other than that, you're, you're I think a lot of it is I got control of the one who controls my fate. Yeah. And there's yeah. a lot of verses you could you could use to leverage that perspective. You know, if you mm -hmm. obey me. I'll bless you. Exactly. If you don't obey me, I will curse you. Exactly. And over and over, it's that yeah. mentality. And uh, even all the way in the New Testament, James, you know, what do not do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. Whatever a man mm. sows will reap. Yeah. And it's like you you get that sense. And then, of course, you brought up the uh, prosperity gospel. This, you know, mm. if you put that on steroids. It's like, yeah, God not only will protect you from the bullies and the bad stuff mm. and the, you know, the car accidents. He wants to give you some some bling, man. He wants to give yeah. you a really nice car and a yeah. really nice house. Well, and that's why I say the church that I went to, it wasn't full on prosperity gospel, but it was, it was because it was that, you know, here's how you're going to get blessed. Mm. And the blessing could be, I remember one time I asked a family member, like, why do you, as a Christian, I asked, why do you tithe so much and, and give all, so, much, so much offering? Don't you think God would, you know, be honored by you kind of getting out of debt? And then maybe you can go back to giving to the church. And uh, I said, well, what do you get out of giving? And one of the responses was, I get blessed in all kinds of ways. One of the ways is God protects me from dangers seen and unseen. That's a common prayer. And I said, that that kind of sounds like you're paying protection money to the mob. Like, are you saying, like, if you don't give, God's going to stop protecting you? Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> this is a dangerous world. Things can happen. You know, you better keep paying, you know, this money or, you know, you never know what could happen. Yeah. So, yeah, I think there is there is that sense of uh, God is the blesser and, uh, you know, he could also, you know, send the locust <laughs> if you don't, you know, do what's right by him. So, I yeah, wanna, that was, yeah. I want to get back to your story in a second, and I, I, I'm sorry for the sidetrack questions, but no, good. since we're on this topic, can I ask, did you ever at that time or, or around that time between then and your deconversion deal with the issue of when God just never blesses certain people like it's just 
like um, a kid that gets cancer at three and, and ends up, you know, in a hospital for the next two years and then it's over. Mm. Um, Are you saying before my deconversion? Yeah. Like, like just, yeah. When you're, when you're still no. Christian, that whole idea of like, why is it that there's certain people where God just, it's like the ultimate cursing of people that are otherwise kind of, you, you know, you could certainly from a theological perspective say, well, you're all guilty and you're all deserve, you deserve exactly. hell. So what are you exactly. complaining about? Exactly. But like, you know, a little kid that's just going to have no real life and then die young or, you know, family that, you know, as you know, people have waited so long to get married they finally get married. They have, have kids and the kids die in a car accident. All the kinds of variations of these horror stories where people just, mm. life just gets worse and worse and worse and it falls apart. And it's like, well, God never really chose to bless them. And especially when you look at the kids involved, it's like, mm. what did they do? And it, did that ever give you angst thinking, why, no, why can't no, they get ever get the good no. side of God? I forced those things into my worldview through some of the means that you mentioned, you know, we're all born in sin. So, you know, uh, any ounce of the fact that we still get breath in our lungs is grace, yeah. let alone, you know, that some people get more than that. Um, yeah, I, I had little ways that I quieted, you know, those questions when they, when they raised up. Um, and I think there may have been some cognitive dissonance there. Uh, or just some just just plain ignoring it, you know. Um, Agreed. They don't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so yeah, I I I think I got I got saved a couple of times. In those kind of churches, it's common, you know. If you do something bad enough, you're going to go up again for another altar call, because mm-hmm. as far as you know, you pretty much you may have very well lost your salvation. Um, is there a big celebration for people that do it? Not, not so much a celebration as much as a prodigal son coming home moment, okay. uh, without the celebration, just the, the welcoming back, like, oh, you made the right decision. You know, now you'll be on the, the straight and narrow this time you won't stray. Um, you know, and of course you stray again because, you know, you curse when you stub your toe or something like that. Um, but I never put too much thought into it. Uh, there wasn't a lot of doctrine in terms of what does it actually mean to be saved, uh, at least not for the kids um, when I was there. Um, and I'm talking as a as a young teen. But um, all that changed around age 15 or so. Um, my youth pastor asked me to lead a, a, a worship service on our Friday night youth group. And I agreed to do it for two reasons. One, it was no big deal because I liked the songs we sung anyway. So being up there leading a song was, hey, it's just more fun. And let me just say, too, I think a lot of the most impactful thing for me as a child in church was the songs. The songs, even though they weren't what somebody who's more on the the more theologically astute would, would probably say some of the songs could have used some work. Mm. But the songs did personify God in such a way as to, to they depicted him as someone with a will, someone with power, someone uh, who, who loves, um, and someone who was worthy of worship. Mm. And so just I mean, week in, week out. So Friday night, I'm singing these songs. Saturday, I'm learning new ones to sing. At choir rehearsal. Sunday, we're singing them with the whole entire church. You know, speak to one another with spiritual songs and hymns. That was speaking to me more than any sermon. And so throughout the week, those songs would just come dancing in my head. Even when I'm, you know, cutting cutting class in hallways and, you know, trying to get a girl to let me take her bra off. <laughs> Worship songs are like dancing through my head. Like uh, those laying in bed at night those songs are dancing you know through my head um so that was the most impactful part of church for me um so when this youth pastor said hey can you lead one of these friday night worship services lead worship i was like yeah but the second reason why i did it was i thought oh this will make me more popular with the church girls here Mm -hmm. because you know like like the girls (laughs) um and so i agreed to do it but then the other thing was i said oh even though the pastor's sermons were not very impactful to me, I was always impressed with the way he was able to weave his message together and have some kind of analogy. 
I remember as a as a even as a preteen, paying attention to his analogies, and I always remember thinking these this is for the adults because they were always like work based analogies, but they worked. I got them. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. So when this youth pastor asked me to lead the service, I was like, oh, I could um, I could come up with a deep message and come up with a school based analogy. This would be like my chance to do what the the big pastor does on Sunday mornings. So I, I struck up in my mind, I struck up a deal with God. I said, okay, if I don't curse this week, if I don't cut class this week, if I don't get in any fights this week, if I don't sleep in any girls this week, that's my part, God. Then you got to make this worship service real spiritual so that I can get more church girls like to like me. <laughs> um, and I said, oh, and also, this is kind of where it all kicked off for me. I'm going to read the Bible this week after school so that I can have something deep to say in between these songs. And that'll, mm -hmm. that'll boost my, my little buzz in this church circle. So I made it through the week with no cursing. Hardest thing I ever tried to do. Uh, walked away from fights, no girls, no cutting class. And then Thursday, the day before the, the, the Friday night service, I said, Oh, that's right. I'm supposed to be reading the Bible so I can get something deep. Let me go home and do that. So I ran home, flipped open my Bible to about the middle and I ended up in Psalm 90. And if I had read any other verse, I don't know what would have happened, if anything would have happened. But I read Psalm 90, and the first two verses introduced me to a concept that I had never considered before. Uh, the psalm is said to have been written by Moses. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. That was a little weird. How is a person going to be a dwelling place? Okay. Okay says, even before the mountains were brought forth, before you made the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And when I read those words, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God, I just sat there thinking, how long is that? <laughs> um, like, okay, so everlasting, that means you don't have an ending, which I can get that, you're God. But that also means you don't have a beginning. Everlasting, everlasting. And just that concept like of eternality, I had never considered that before. And then to think of a being who like personifies eternality. He's the epitome of it. I remember looking up into the sky out my bedroom window and I was like, who are you? Like, how how's that? How do you not have a beginning? And that was the beginning of my theological life. Uh, wanting to find out about this person in I guess in the sky or wherever who had no beginning mm -hmm. and I came across Isaiah I think 57 that says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity how do you inhabit eternity? and so that alone I became just a worshiper of God I'm like okay and it's funny this is all coming together now that was the first time hell started to matter to me mm -hmm. because I said wait so there's, there's, I don't know why it never clicked before, but I'm like, wait, if this being is from everlasting to everlasting, God is unlike anything I've ever encountered. He actually could put me in hell and I, there's nothing I can do about it. Like, oh, I guess that's, that's kind of how it clicked because then it made me say, oh, so it's not just this life <laughs> that I need to be saved from. There's an eternity that I need to be saved from. And this God is the one who's can speak to all that. So I became a worshiper of God. I didn't know what the gospel was. I just thought the gospel was be good or you'll go to hell. Hell started to matter at that point. So it's like, it seems like everything just took on such a more profound, yeah. bigger meaning. That's amazing. Yeah. I could see that <clears throat> being that impactful. Can I ask a, a question just to go back to something you said a few paragraphs ago? Sure. You, you mentioned girls a few times mm -hmm. and you've mentioned things that you would experience and I don't want to, you know, pry into your details, but my experience growing up, mm -hmm. if you saw the edge of a woman's bra strap mm -hmm. and you didn't look away in like a millisecond, it was guilt for a month. I mean, mm -hmm. intense guilt. <laughs> my level of purity culture mm -hmm. was much different. Mm -hmm. And if I had done mm. some of the things that i think you're alluding to i would have 
that alone would have made me feel like I was not a Christian. Mm. And I know that's very different and different, you know, yeah. different ways that people grow up. But how did that, like, did purity and shame and virginity culture come into play for you much? Or was there a sense Only of, like, after could... this moment that I'm just talking about. Before that okay. moment, I was trying to sleep with as many girls as possible. Okay, gotcha. That's just what we did in, in my neighborhood. It was, I was trying to get the girls from the church. I was trying to get the girls from the neighborhood. I was trying to get the girls from the school because it was, you know, that old saying of a notch on your belt. Guys may have competitions. How many girls have you been with? And if your number wasn't high enough, you get laughed at. So you weren't, um, just to wrap this part, you you weren't feeling overwhelming senses of guilt until until this, like you said, this transition point. But until this transition you point, over this. Okay. not at all, gotcha. not at all. Um, like I said, I prayed every night. Uh, my grandmother told me something when I was a kid. She told me prayer is like food for your soul. And if you don't pray, your soul is going to starve. Mm -hmm. And so no matter what dirt I did, but my I prayed every single night after that. And I remember, this is the first time I'm thinking about this in years. I remember when I used to pray every single night, I used to tell God there was an age I was going to get to when I would give him my life. First it was 12. Then when I turned 12, I was like, oh, no, 15. Then when I turned 15, I was like, oh, no, 18. But then this transition happened when I was 15. But uh, but until this transition, there was no guilt. There was no, I didn't, I didn't think of God as a person until I read about this, you know, everlasting to everlasting, this, you know, this being who's, until then, God was just this, a power in the sky that I, you know, I needed to appease. Yeah. Like your whole your whole experience was became becoming um what's the word transcendent or transcending yeah exactly just to get bigger, exactly. bigger. I, yeah i had some similar experiences i think with certain authors mm -hmm. i of course you know read like crazy but a lot of pastors but a lot of pastors you'd read were just more focused on the gospel mm -hmm. but you'd occasionally get these writers who would just blow your mind yes yeah. lewis is is one um mm -hmm. that book if you ever read it is a, a severe mercy um mm -hmm. that's just a, blew my mind um gotcha. of course think people like dallas willard the divine mm. conspiracy where you're like you have to read, read this sentence like over and over <laughs> and over to get it you're like this is so profound but yeah. you, know, you get those waves and you're like oh my gosh there's something yeah. much bigger going on here and i've well, not been a part of it and i need yeah. to be a part of it yep and the term you use is is key because and it's interesting you bring up those authors not long after maybe about a year or two after that i got a hold of uh aw tozer's knowledge of the holy Yes. And his chapter on the transcendence of God, it took me back to that Psalm 90. It's like, that's what it was. Like, that's, I was addicted to that, to the transcendence mm. of God. Yeah. Um, so I spent about a, yeah, I spent about a year. I kind of became like a recruiter for the youth group. You know, I stopped sleeping around. I stopped, uh, you know, hanging out. Stopped, I, went from, I went from getting F's, straight F's on my report card to straight A's. Um, wow. Yeah. But and that I made your parents happy. <laughs> oh, my mother, I'm sure all of her prayers, all those mornings on her knees praying, it was, it was coming in fruition. God was answering her prayer. Um, and so I didn't know the gospel. I just thought you better be good or you'll go to hell. And now I know that God is big enough to pull that off. And so I was just impressed by that. And uh, I even started doing Christian rap with that mindset. I met another guy who was a... <laughs> He was a God-fearer like me, church-going, young God, but still attached to the culture. And I'm like, yo, how are you still attached to the culture and you calling yourself a Christian? He was like, well, I rap for the Lord. And he, he kicked the verse for me that blew me away. And I started doing what he was doing. Me and him started a rap group. And neither one of us were, were really sound in terms of our, our uh, handle on the Bible or the gospel. We both were on some, you know, be good or go to hell. Like, I don't know how Jesus fit into it, but he was in it somewhere. Um, but it still was like, you got to be good enough to be saved. Hmm. That was 92, 93, 94. We met other guys who were doing the same thing. And I always refer to it like uh, Aquila and Priscilla when they got a hold of, uh, I think it was Apollos. Like, yeah, what are you preaching? Oh, no, nah, that ain't the gospel. And they gave him the gospel. Uh, that's what happened to us. We we met other guys who were doing Christian rap, and they knew the gospel, and they communicated it to us. And um, I remember going to their shows and hearing the gospel at their shows. I'm like, oh wait, that's that's how the story goes. And I thought about all the altar calls I had responded to. I was like, I never said yes to that. I was saying yes to something else. 
oh no, I want that. I want, and I became a a a recipient of the grace that I heard in the gospel message, and that that changed my life again. Mm-hmm. Um, and I sort of it, it, it sort of became a mission of mine because I'm like, yo, I, I spent 16 years growing up in church, and I never, I said yes to God a bunch of times, I never said yes to the gospel. And I said, man, how many other people are saying yes, but they don't know what they're saying yes to? How many other people are saying no, but they don't even know what they're saying no to? And my mission, my life's mission for the next 30 years became, let me clear up for people what the offer on the table is, what you're responding to. Mm -hmm. And so all my efforts to get good at rap were, I need to elucidate and clear up this message and make the offer, present the offer as attractive as it actually is, you know, from what I was seeing in in the way the, the gospel comes together in the New Testament. Let me show you how, how, uh, how beautiful this offer of eternal life is mm-hmm. and spent 30 years going around the world, going to Bible college, going to seminary, becoming an urban apologist, um, just trying to make sure that people understood the offer on the table mm-hmm. and uh, the legacy, even to this day, like, you know, there's a legacy behind that effort um, that well, I now I, look back. Yeah. I got to say then let's, <clears throat> let's dive into the meat of it. What is the what is the gospel? Yeah. Um let Paul and uh New Testament authors tell it. <laughs> so which rendition do you want? <laughs> because <laughs> whichever one was your at your highest point of, of, of fervor. Okay, got you. Uh at my highest point of fervor, I thought that Jesus and Paul were saying the same thing. And so the gospel was um you know, I've never heard someone start with that. That's a great, <laughs> like you're, you're giving breadcrumbs for what's to come. Exactly. <laughs> While Jesus and Paul were on the same page in my mind, the gospel was uh, Jesus is uh, the second Adam come to make up for what the first Adam uh, got wrong. The first Adam walked away from God in the garden um, and introduced sin into the human condition so that everyone who's born after him is born contaminated, infected um, uh, with the, with a sinful nature. And I never really spent much time on uh, a doctrine of imputation in terms of how do we get this sinful nature? But I can think at various times in my Christian walk, it was, I probably said all the Christian answers. It's in our blood. Uh, it's because of, you know, uh, the father's authority. It's because it's the headship of Adam. All these different ways where why his sin becomes our condition. And then our condition uh, ties us into his guilt. There's, there's ways to get around the convoluted message there because Paul says two different things in Romans 5. Um, is it is it his guilt that we're, is it our guilt? Is it his sin? Is it our sin? You know, But it's definitely his condemnation that we're taking part in. So I found different ways to work out uh, for anybody who's lost in that. Just Romans 5, Paul makes an argument for why Jesus, Jesus's obedience and resurrection now goes to all men because Adam's disobedience and condemnation somehow goes out to all men and theologians are, are, struggle to try to try to explain exactly how that happens um mm-hmm. so throughout my 30 years i probably said a, a, a very a variety of things in terms of how we get adam's sin and guilt and condemnation but um but either way day, we're all we're all screwed <laughs> we're yeah, all in big the, trouble. exactly and the reason why the world is the way that it is is because of what adam did and we do what we do because of what adam did and what we do proves that we're related to adam So we're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. And because that's our nature, we need a we need a savior. We need some kind of righteousness that's not going to come from us because we can't produce the righteousness that God requires. And the entire Old Testament was just to demonstrate that no matter what we do, humans under the best conditions, without the law, with the law, without God's blessings, with God's blessings. Without a land, with a land. Humans under the best conditions and worst conditions could not produce the righteousness that God requires. 
One group has God's law written on their hearts. The other group had God's law written on stone and neither could produce the righteousness that God required. And that's why we're doomed. That's why hell is uh, a just punishment for everyone who breathes. Um, but God sent his son to obey the law perfectly when we couldn't. And then to boot, this same son is going to die for our sins and pay the penalty that we couldn't pay. Or if we could pay it, it would take us forever to pay it. And that is what hell is. Jesus died and three days of him, uh, well, three hours of him hanging on the cross, three days of him in the grave is equal to the entire world uh, for eternity uh, paying for their sins. And those who believe in him, uh, his righteousness gets accredited to their account. There's no righteousness in your account, but your belief, God's going to count your belief as righteousness. But it's really the righteousness of Jesus. So thank him for that. And um, because God raised him from the dead, proving that it, it wasn't his sin, it was our sin, those who believe in him get his resurrected life and are with him forever, either in heaven or on earth or the new heaven and the new earth. And, uh, you know, we all live happily ever after except for the ones who are in hell. <laughs> um, that was so clear. I feel like I need to, we need to have someone start playing just as I am and do a little ultra call here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that message, you know, getting a hold of that message, it, I mean, it 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 brought me to life in ways. Almost like just imagine if your, your favorite story, and I was a kid, it was the never ending story. Imagine if your favorite story, the story that brought you to tears and that inspired you, imagine finding out it's real. Like that's, that's sort of the impact that the gospel message had on me. Hmm. Yeah. So I guess my follow-up question, now that you've um, hopefully saved a bunch of people here in the last 10 minutes. <laughs> now that that's clear, the, the big question that's left is what the hell's wrong with the gospel? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anybody who just heard me run through that, like, man, is that what I'm, you know, should have been responding to? Like, maybe I want to go back and say yes to that. It's a great story. If it were true, I would still be preaching it. I would still be commending it to people. I would I base my entire life on it. Um, I spent a hundred thousand dollars being educated to tell it better. Um, close to a hundred thousand dollars. Some of that was just you know. adding the tithes. You're, you're there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, if it was true, it would, it would still be worth spending my life to tell. Um, what's wrong with it is it's just not true. It's, it's, uh, there's so many parts of the story that fall apart upon inspection. Um, there's so many parts of, you know, you know, like I st started saying, Jesus's gospel about what the kingdom is and what the good news is and Paul's doctrine of sin. They're two different things. Um, not only is Jesus's gospel and Paul's doctrine, two different things. But what Paul says about the Old Testament, what Paul says happened in the Garden of Eden is not even what the author of Genesis, authors of Genesis, it's not what they say happened in the Garden of Eden. And so I've got people who want me to uh, to respect this idea of progressive revelation so that even if the author of Genesis was not saying what Paul says in the course of time, can't you see how God is laying out that what Paul is saying is actually true? How no one in the Old Testament could actually, uh, you know, be righteous enough. And then when Paul looks back at Genesis, he's able to see things that the, the original author. No, I don't see that at all now. Um, mm -hmm. I see the original Genesis story as saying uh, something very, uh, very much in line with what ancient people were saying with creation stories at that time. And I see Paul very opportunistically, I'm not trying to, you know, uh, incriminate him, but I think Paul was doing what other uh, Jewish men were doing at that time in trying to make sense of the nation's plight, uh, trying to make sense of why uh, they're still under the, the boot of Rome. And they began to go back and look at the garden and say, dang, maybe, maybe something happened back there. Because after all this time, Pharisees and Sadducees, you know, notwithstanding, We've not been able to to get out from under the boot of our oppressors, and um, mm. yeah, all that to say, I just there's 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 so many ways 
that you could demonstrate that this story that we tell about humanity and God and a garden and a Satan and a hell and a heaven and a cross and a Satan, there's so many ways that you can just demonstrate this is just not true. It doesn't, it doesn't stand up. You can hold it together. Like, uh, like I'm doing with my, my webcam right now. The fact that it's still acting right is a, you know, is a miracle, but my webcam is, is being held together by, like I said, bubble gum and chicken wire right now. So is the gospel message. Uh, and if you start pulling that away, it falls apart. And when I began to see that I was in seminary and they were trying to stitch it together and I'm saying, but wait, that falls apart. Hmm. And that falls apart and they're trying to hold it together and they want me to come. No, no, help us hold up this wall. I'm like, I didn't sign up to do that. I thought this, I came here to, to see how, how well this story held together, not how well it does not And I don't know if they realized that what they were showing me was, uh, for instance, when you start talking about why or how the New Testament authors use the Old Testament and how they're able to interpret certain things as a prophecy that when you go back and read, that's no prophecy. And if it is, it's not referring to what years. How are we justifying that again? I'm like, nah, I don't see that. And I don't feel comfortable going out of here telling people that. I feel like I'd be lying. Yeah. And I don't see how you don't see yourself lying to me if you want me to believe this. Like, how are you, you know, how are you comfortable telling me that this is what's going on in this text when clearly this is not? Mm. This is equivalent to pissing on my head and telling me it's rain. Yeah. Um, one of the things yeah. that you're saying too it reminds me of a feeling I had of of just is this the best that the God of the universe can do? Like, like he is the most in my mind back then <laughs> theologically he's the most brilliant mm. mathematician, mm. scientist, so to speak, if you could call him that, uh, artist, certainly musician. Like he is he's the master poet of your life of the universe. Mm. Like he's he's the crafter galore, mm. and he can make stars and galaxies. And the best he could do for us is this book. Yeah. And it be, I began to really think, like, <laughs> this doesn't sound right. Like, this isn't yeah. the best a God could do that could make universes and galaxies. This is like the worst he could do, wow. apart from just being silent, which is, you know, obviously what actually happened. <laughs> but, like, like, this is garbage. This is a really yeah. garbagey book. And plus, you add well, in all the other crazy stuff that we have to talk about, like the genocides and the land theft and the slavery and the oh stoning. Gosh. Yeah, and yeah. You're like, come on. <laughs> right. Come on. <laughs> well, really? see, now here's the thing I, I know there are people who are watching who would hear that statement, this is the best God could do. And they're thinking about it and they're saying, what do you mean? This book is so, and here's what a lot of Christians don't take into account. The reason why the Bible seems like, what do you mean? This is the best God can do. This book is so grand. And so, because very many Christians are still in the stage where they're having fun trying to figure out the mysteries of the Bible. Yeah. I know it says this and I know it says that. And is it that's got to fit together some kind of way? Oh, I'm going to be the one to solve this dilemma. And I'm going to be the I find out how this verse and that verse goes together. And it's fun. It's a project. And they feel like they're being let into this divine secret. Very few of them stop to, to take into account the reason why this thing is such a jigsaw puzzle is because you have so many different people writing from so many different perspectives that all disagree. Yep. Your fun is trying to make sense of somebody else's nonsense. And you think in that nonsense lies the wisdom of God. No, it's just two different people with two, two different views on salvation, two different views on all these different ideas. But you feel like it's your challenge. Yeah. But you, there's this huge mission that's laid out before you. But And it's like, if you accept this mission, that's going to give you purpose for the next however long this movie is. The Christian comes to the Bible with that. I'm accepting this mission to make sense of this book. And you feel like you're being invited into God's presence and you get little gold stars for figuring out how this seemingly contradiction can be harmonized. And, you know, that's the that's the thing that makes somebody else say, no, this is the best God can do, because look how grand this thing is if you can make it all fit together. And I understand that. I just I see the enterprise for what it is now. Hmm. I think too, one, one of the things that you, what you're saying makes me think of is um, not just the idea that there's more than one way of, of them presenting the gospel, meaning Jesus versus Paul, but there's also just this sense that within the whole thing, um, and I'm, I'm just going to highlight two things. There's a lot of things we could say here, but 
number one, there's a lot of influences, like extremely heavy influences from other religions and cults of that day, mm. where they're they're not just either they're generically influencing stuff, but sometimes they're literally quoting from them, yeah. um, other taking motifs and copying them. But then on top of that, mm. what what you have end up what you end up having is like, okay, they so they copied from other other religions and other cults mm. of that day. Then as they crafted this story, the story comes and it gets crafted, and then we get this final version. But this there's this piece in the middle mm. where the church that was had different political reasons for thinking different things, they were able to shift different pieces of it. Yeah. And so you don't we don't actually have any way of telling who controlled the text. So I'm, I'm, I know one of the classic ones is like where Paul mm. is arguing. Is there something wrong with with eating meat sacrificed to idols? And he's like, no, an idol's not real. It's not. There's nothing there. It's just the only God is God. You know, it's mm -hmm. God, and and you know, if you can't really sacrifice to an idol because it's like mm -hmm. you're sacrificing to a, to a nothing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, go ahead. It doesn't matter. But then, like two chapters later, it says, "What are we gonna? Why would we have anything to do with this? The the, the devil, the devil's work. Right. Of course not. Don't eat it. Don't do it. You know, we don't. Especially we don't want to cause a stumbling block. And it's like." wait a second, it sounds mm. a lot like this isn't Paul. It sounds like mm. Paul wrote one of them, but I'm not mm. sure which one. And then someone else said, yeah, but I don't want to go there. So <laughs> let's, and so mm. the text has been tweaked and then you get to like, mm. we've found at least nine different endings of the gospel of Mark, mm. um, some of which don't include the resurrection. And it's like all this stuff goes, it just, the list goes on and on. And mm. you're like, okay, there's been heavy outside influence. And then there's been heavy tampering since then. And you're like, this this adds up to a real mess and especially for me what one of the the big things that's come become a part of my story is just realizing that a lot of these teachers you know the bible professors the the pastors they mm. probably knew some of this stuff that would have been to you and me a question to say wait wait a second i got a question about that can you can you explain some more but instead they don't even bring up the objection or the issue they just keep it real quiet mm. and it's like okay so the gospel, <clears throat> so the Bible, the New Testament quotes the book of Enoch about 200 times. Well, why didn't you tell me that? I was in Bible college for four and a half freaking years. You no, not one single professor told me that it quotes Enoch. I mean, we know the two it quotes in like Jude and First Peter, but like mm. tell me about the other 198 that it, that mm. it quotes the book of Enoch. They never told you that it quotes and and references and and uses motifs from Homer's Odyssey mm. dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of times. Mm. They don't talk about the influence of Plutarch. And all these other guys and quoting from Josephus, it's like, come on. Mm. If if you wanna <laughs> if you wanna believe this stuff, fine, but at mm. least tell be honest, tell people where did this come from for as much yeah. as you academically know. Mm. And it's like they're just like, no, I don't mm. care, la 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 la. It doesn't exist. It's just, you know, this is the God's word. And it's like once you get to a certain point where you realize they're either specifically tricking you or they're just intentionally ignorant, you're like, come on, you, not only does this book not sound so good you don't sound so good either. Mm. Like you're, you're either a trickster, either uh, passively or actively, but either way, you don't sound like a man of God. You sound like, you sound like someone that just wants to carry some kind of party message and yeah. you're not thinking about where it came from or the implications. Yeah. And it just, it, it just keeps on falling apart. Yeah. I read a quote, not a quote. Somebody made a comment under a video yesterday uh, of a counter apologist. The counter apologist was critiquing a young earth creationist. And somebody made a comment because the question that the counter apologist asked was like, you know, sort of like what you just tried to do. She said, I don't want to call this person a liar. But and the counter apologist was trying to be nice. And I get in trouble, too, because I say I felt like, you know, that some of these men are being dishonest. Um, some of these some of these theologians are being dishonest. And the, the comment underneath the, the video, somebody said it's impossible to be educated, ignorant, and honest at the same time. Like, mm. you, if you're educated, don't play ignorant. And if you play ignorant, you're, you can't claim to be being honest. Mm. And so I don't, I don't know what to say without calling someone a liar. It's just, but you say you're educated. And I think what, I, the nicest way I can say it is, you're just so committed to your position that you can't allow your education to allow you to be honest. Yeah. 
And I don't know what that makes you. Can I ask, that really brings up the issue too of extreme indoctrination mm. and just the fact that they're, yes, they're, they're, they're guilty of what they're doing, but at the same time, it's just when you're indoctrinated so heavily, it's like you're just passing on what's been passed on to you, what's been passed on to them. Yeah. Yeah. Did you feel like you were indoctrinated when you finally moved on from it? That's a really good question. Uh, the only reason why I can't outright say yes is because in a lot of ways, I did it to myself. Hmm. I put myself in places where I could hear the gospel message. It, it, uh, resonated with me. And so I dug in deeper. I went to A.W. Tozer's book. I went to, I listened to Hank Hanegraaff's Bible Answer Man. And oh, um, <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Like I went to these places. So if there was indoctrination, yes, I was a, I was a, I was very young, you know, I'm 16, 17 years old. Um, I remember my pride getting in the way when I'm out there I did people who some of these these the urban cults that I was battling against they're they're urban cults uh, in, in every inner city that just have these very Afrocentric we're going to use the Quran and use the Bible to preach something completely different but some of them would raise some of the objections that counter apologists are raising today about Osiris you know being a template for a dying and rising God they would raise these things and. Because of my own pride and my own uh, credulity to the Christian message, I would fight tooth and nail against those things. And so it's hard to necessarily blame someone else with indoctrinating me because I think I took the syringe that they may have filled it up with all the apologetic nonsense, but I took the syringe and injected it into myself. So there is indoctrination but I have a hard time blaming anyone for my indoctrination. You know what I mean? Yeah. I hear what you mean. I think it, I, I definitely agree. And I, I'm very much similar. I, I mm. was, I dove into the stuff like crazy. I think it's kind of like if you were to, if say everybody in the planet was, was dying of cancer, everybody. Mm. And somebody tells you there's this new medicine that you really need to start researching. Mm. It's just, it's going to fix it. It's going to fix it. And you're like, you're driven to to do it and, and you don't know that secretly it's a placebo it's a it's a mm -hmm. sugar pill but someone's like yeah we, we got to get this out to everybody and start selling it like crazy because it'll it'll cure everybody mm -hmm. well you at that point do have a choice to say well i don't want i don't want to read about it i don't want i don't care about your, your your pill that can save us all um but in a sense because of the context because everyone is already in yeah. your mind dying and desperate for help that if someone says I, I have a true answer to this it's like yeah i'm i'm responsible whether or not i i do more digging and research into this medicine mm. but at the same time you've you've told me this is this is the ultimate answer to everything and mm. this is it's not just like an answer it's the answer it's the only mm. answer and you're in a desperate spot like you need yeah. it now yeah and it, you know you can't wait this has to be dealt with immediately and I think that's where I, I kind of, I still hold them culpable and I include them, them myself because I was, I was a preacher, mm -hmm. so to speak. I, I didn't, didn't actually get a pastor, but I preached in terms of um, soup kitchens mm -hmm. in Chester there outside of Philly. I was doing soup kitchens for years. I uh, mm -hmm. preached a lot, uh, did a lot of stuff with uh, Chester high, high school, um, preaching to, to young high school students. And like, I was part of it. I preached, I did preach in my church, um, the mm -hmm. Blue church in Springfield, Pennsylvania. I preached many times and youth group. It's like I became part of the system, but at the same time, mm. when I look back at it, I think the original issue is that we just don't tell each other the truth. And mm. that, to me, that it's like I, I see what you're saying, but it's like a both end. I think there's yeah. there's a culpability, and that's where yeah. I think as parents, that's where I'm like, if you're teaching your kids blood magic, um, you know that mm. you need the blood of Jesus to be saved from this mm. God that created this problem of hell in the first place. Like, I'm sorry, you're <laughs> yes, you got it, you inherit, you inherited it, mm. so you're not really culpable. But at some point, you have to you have to take responsibility for what you're doing with your life. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Mm. Uh, so the title of my book might actually fly in the face of what I just said, because the book is titled, let there be gaslight. And I am charging not all 
but I am charging certain Christian thinkers with gaslighting folk because Absolutely. so for me, the major issue that that led to my descent uh, or ascent from Christianity um, was when I began to see trusted Christian uh, theologians, biologists, geneticists, giving a nod to evolution. But then coming back to the scriptures to try to say, here's how it could still be true. And I think, had I listened to their instruction, then I think I would have been able to charge them with indoctrination. Because up until that point, I think I was a willing receptacle of, I'm seeking this information out. I felt like I was vetting through it and choosing. Like I was never a Calvinist. I was never, I may, I may have been full on Arminian before I knew what it was. Then when I saw the doctrines of Calvinism, I said, you know what? I think there's truth in both. But I always was the type to pick and choose. I wouldn't let anyone indoctrinate me. I would pick and choose what made the most sense to me in light of the available data. Did you That's feel like why, the available data included very, very divergent views of... Yeah, yeah, okay. because this is what I was saying before. I didn't think about it in terms of these disjointed authors with disjointed ideas. I thought of this one divine author behind it all, and it was my honor. It was my privilege to work out how it all fit together. Mm -hmm. So maybe in the mystery of God's incomprehensibility, the Calvinists and the Arminians are right. And we just kind of live in the tension in between. But I get to pick and choose what I want to take from each of them. Well, I meant even in the bigger, like stepping back a little bit from that, did mm -hmm. you feel like you were free to research people who weren't who weren't believers who were saying, I'm going to look at this academically? No, but, no. Because like, no. like if you have a bookshelf of 100 books and someone says, I want you to do some research, but you can only research from these four books. And you're like, but there's 100 books out there. Yeah, but these four books. Yeah. But do your research. But so now you're making me think. You're making me think because I think I was like the well had been poisoned in terms of critical scholars yeah, uh, and liberal scholars. So the Jesus movement, you probably had classes on this at LBC, right? Uh, yeah. I forget um, it's been a minute, but yeah. Probably. Yeah, yeah. So, no, you know, John Dominic crossing, you know, just stay away from, and not really stay away from, but here's why we don't have to think about what these men are saying, you know, too, too severely. Um, so I was kind of steered away from critical scholarship. The first class at Westminster is a class on uh, where you go through Machen's book, Christianity and Liberalism, where he basically is trying to shore up Christianity in the early 20th century against the rising tide of liberalism. Mm. And he, you know, he makes liberalism out to be a different religion. And I believe he's, he was right about that, but it, it put your defensive walls up to anything that smelled like liberalism, like liberal theology. You ought to be suspect of it from the door. So any good points that they might make, you're already poisoned against them. Uh, but you're not poisoned against them in your mind. You think you've got the antidote for it. Um, not realizing that they were kind of the antidote for, <laughs> for Christian theology. Yeah. Um, it's a great so point. Free, though. We, they do poison the well. I, I haven't yeah. thought about that myself in a while that way, but that's a great way to put it. It's That's exactly what they do. They make it so that the dissenting views are yeah. just, they're stupid or they're at worst demonic. And yeah. it's like, of course, we know that they're wrong. We'll right. look. We'll, we'll give them a little time a day, just right. to just to feel like we're you know being intellectually honest. But we already know they're 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 ridiculous and they're yeah. very very foolish. Right. And if they don't bow their knee, they will pay the price for their foolishness. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And 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 in that is an implicit hell scare. You know what I mean? Like you're talking about them, but you're saying it to your your Bible college or your seminary students. The impression is you don't want to end up like them, hmm. you know? Um, so, yeah, I think I do have to factor that in to the indoctrination of how how warded off of the opposing views were you. Um, yeah, that's a good point. So you're so you're there at, at uh, seminary. Mm -hmm. Did you feel like that was going to be the place where your faith was going to be solidified based on some of the other things you were dealing with in life? Um, not solidified because it wasn't shaken. 
when I got to seminary, I was I went there to just get an academic version of what I was already doing for the past 25 years. So I was an urban apologist. So apologetics was a big part of my musical ministry, big part of what I was doing in the streets of Philadelphia. Um, and I had begun after the rap group ended in 2008 or nine, I went into the schools teaching character education. And I knew that I was going to be getting deeper into secular academia and running into people who may have an academic uh, approach to the Bible. So I said, I need to be able to defend the faith against that, not just the street skeptic. Hmm. So I went to Westminster not to be more sure, but to be more, uh, I guess, ready to defend the text in the original languages, um, from you know liberalism and things like that, theological liberalism and things like that. Um, the only shaking that had happened prior to that, well, let me not say only, uh, the shakings that had happened prior to that was realizing that when I thought I was, when I was quote unquote speaking in tongues, that wasn't real. And a lot of the charismatic things that I experienced in my church life growing up, you know, I, I don't, I, I got to the point where I did not count that as the spirit of God moving anymore. Mm. And so that made me a lot more like, hmm, so you can be wrong. And so I stopped being as dogmatic because that impact of I could be wrong. I could be strong and wrong. That made me take my foot off the gas a little bit and say, oh, maybe there's some gray area. Maybe there's some, but my faith wasn't shaking. I knew there was in my mind, there was a black and white way to believe, even if I did not know what the black and white was on every area. Mm -hmm. So I was okay with being gray and open to hearing ideas about what was black and white when it comes to baptism, when it comes to, uh, you know, I think I was, I was pretty firm on whether or not you could lose your salvation, right? You couldn't, in my view. Um, but I was, I was, open to being great on other things, predestination, you know, the will and things like that. So when I went to seminary, I was, I was at first pleased to see that you could be gray about some, certain things. I was like, oh, that's, I was leaning towards the gray anyway. You guys just made it a little more acceptable to be gray. I was good. Until I came across uh, Peter N's book, uh, The Evolution of Adam. The school had let him go probably about a good five or six years before I even got there. But in my Old Testament theology course, um, Peter N's book was listed as a book that you could read and review about the Old Testament. And I did what, you know, any good Christian would do. I read it and I tore it to shreds. One, because he was talking like evolution was true. Two, because he said, because evolution is true, then Paul was wrong about there being a historical Adam. Three, I tore it to shreds because even though he says Paul is wrong about there being a historical Adam, we still need the gospel. We still need Jesus because sin and death are still real problems. And I just remember sitting there saying, first of all, evolution is not true. Second of all, how dare you say Paul was wrong about, about Adam? Third, if Paul was wrong about Adam being the entrance of sin and death into the world, your whole claim about we still need the gospel is irrelevant. If there's a naturalistic explanation for origins, there likely is a naturalistic explanation for what we're calling sin and death. So you're not going to try to hold me to the gospel once you remove Genesis in Paul's theology. Hmm. But it did get me thinking, hmm, how come Jesus doesn't mention Adam as the entrance of sin and death? If he's here to fix that problem, you would think he would name that as, you know why I'm here, right? Because No, he says he's here for Israel. Um. And so it, it got me thinking, I said, well, man, even though I don't think ends is right. And I had another professor, a uh, Hebrews language professor, who I, I bragged to him. Like, yo, you know that guy, Peter Enns? I destroyed his book in this paper I wrote. 
And I thought he was going to pat me on the back like, attaboy. All he said was, well, you know, pizza, dear friend, and we just had dinner last night. I was like, oops. <laughs> and then he said, but these are the books that influence Enns to think the way he thinks. I was like, all right, cool. I'll check those out one day, maybe. And then later on, it hit me. I said, hey, how come he didn't say Peter Enns was wrong? Like, all he said was go check out these books that Enns read. And, uh, you know, I'm not a genius, but I could put two and two together pretty, pretty quickly. Give me enough time. End of the day, I said, is he trying to tell me Peter Enns is right? But he can't say it because he'll end up like ends. He'll end up. And eventually the school, he, he left the school as well. So all my favorite professors are no longer at the school. And all of them were good friends with Peter Enns. <laughs> I mean, they took um, a more progressive Christian theological route. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for anyone they supported know, ends. Yeah. For anyone who doesn't know Peter Enns, just to give context, that's what we're talking about. He's, he's a more progressive Christian who has certainly deconstructed a lot of aspects of this. But um, from what I understand, he still thinks that there's something to it and that there's really yeah. a God yeah. and that, yeah. that Jesus is really a savior, which yeah. is apart from, as opposed to being just mythology to be discarded. Right. Yeah. Deconstructed, though not deconverted. Yeah. And, uh, but for me, that was never an option. Like once I, I, I kind of got the hint that Peter Enns might've been on to something, I never went back to read ends again. I started going to the people that influenced mm. uh, the Christians to, to rethink evolution. Okay, There were Christians in the camp, theistic evolutionists, who were saying, here's what we now know. And it's not just the atheists who are saying this, the ones who are biased against God. These are Christians who, who desperately want to believe, who... They went to school to be geneticists so that they can prove the Bible true. So that, and in the course of looking at the evidence, had to say, "Okay, we can't say that anymore. We now know that that's not humans are connected to the rest of the animal kingdom, not by a common designer, by a common ancestor." Mm. And I'm looking at these people like, once I got wind of that. Deconstructing without deconverting was never an option. I saw, like, it all, it all made sense. It's almost like usual suspects at the end, you know, uh, where he's been hearing this story and he's been buying into this story the entire time. Then he starts seeing things around the room like, wait, the bottom of this coffee cup was in this guy's story and that painting on the wall was in this guy's story. And wait, wait, everything this guy just told me is I could see it in this. This story is not true. Like once I had to consider a another means for human origins, everything fell into place. That's why that story doesn't make sense. That's why that there's a disconnect there. That's why that the 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 nonsensical nature of the Bible upon plain reading made sense to me. And every attempt after that to try to, but if you do this, you can make it make sense. And if you do it all just seemed like, I said, no, nah, I, I, I'm not doing that. If God wants to speak to me, he's free to speak to me. But I'm not going to spend the rest of my life trying to make sense of nonsense. Um, mm. I wasted 30 years. I said, you're not going to get another day out of me. And I, I, didn't, I didn't say it. I felt it. I felt my heart. It's almost like when you, <laughs> I remember working out and I'm doing reps on the bench and I'm trying to, and I get to that point where I'm like, I know this bar is not going back up. And it just starts, and the spotter's got to jump in. I got to the point where I said, God, you got to spot me here. Help my unbelief, because I, I can't get this bar back up. I've seen enough. I can't do this. And if you don't jump in, and I gave God about a good six years mm -hmm. after seminary. The first three of those years, it was still praying, still worshiping, still giving, still after the first three years, I said, okay, I'm starting to get the sense that you're not going, the Bible's not going to do it, but I'm still, I'm still going to give God a chance to step in. Once God didn't step in, 
I said, okay, now I'm going to try my hand at some other things. Like what happens if I, if I do all the forbidden things, does, does conviction set in? Does God rig my life to stop working? Does he ever speak? And like the first three years, it was pious. It, it was piety, piety and praise and prayer. Uh, the three Ps. Uh, the next three years, it was, I'm going to just live. And I want to see if I, like, I got the same result the second three years that I got the first three years. Mm. And I said, so what? Like, do you not exist? Like, wh what's going on here? And to this day, like now we're eight years, <laughs> eight years past. And to this day, nothing from heaven. And, it, and so in 2021, I said, okay, now let me, let me go and do the academic work to figure out why heaven is so quiet. And I went and bought, I spent about a thousand dollars on books, reading everything from uh, Charles Darwin uh, to William Craig uh, to, I mean, everybody, anybody who's ever spoken on anything related to these issues, read it. And just kept hitting the equal sign, adding up, saying, oh, that's why. Oh, that's why. Oh, that's why. Oh, I get it now. Uh, 2021 and 2022, I did the academic work. 2015 to 2020, it was just the life work of trying to see, is there anyone in heaven? Anyone at all? Is anyone in hell? Like, Is there anything happening spiritually in this world? I had to look back at all of the experiences that I thought were spiritual. And try to ask, can I can I explain that without invoking God? And it may be some freaky coincidences, but for the most part, there's nothing that I could point to and, and not explain without invoking God. I'd have to give God the severe benefit of the doubt to say, no, that was him. And I said, but if I stop doing that, it all falls apart. If I stop helping, it falls apart. Mm. Yeah. It's amazing. It isn't it, and I I know that we're we're talking about it very matter of factly, but at the end of the day, too, there's people that are going through this still, mm -hmm. and it's it's terrifying and it's it's real. I mean, I'm nodding my head and kind of smiling because I'm like I'm a, agreeing so much mm. similarity, uh, like what what you started with. Our stories are very similar in many ways, but it's like I I, I do want to acknowledge it's a very serious spot for a lot of people that like this mm. is painful, yeah. and they're realizing too the the implications. Like you know, I don't get to see friends or family that have already gone on to the afterlife. You know, I'm not going to see them there. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, what is my life about now? Where's my morality come from? Um, is there any purpose at all? Am I now yeah. a nihilist and all this stuff? And it just, it, it, the terror of it can just literally take your breath away. And yeah. it's just like, and it, even if you're not that concerned about those ultimate issues, like just realizing, oh shoot, if I go down this path, people are going to hate, some people are going to hate me hate me for this yeah. I, on, on that note i, I did want to since i said that I, was, I wanted to get to that eventually there's no doubt i'm i'm guessing there's no doubt that people have, have accused you of shipwrecking your faith or um you know abandoning the lord whatever mm. um never being saved in the first place what has yeah. been the result <laughs> when, you, when you go through the process you just described in, in mm. such great detail and you and you make it public um you don't just go quietly into the night but you make it public that you're no longer on that on that side mm -hmm. um as you've done and i applaud you for for being public about it but what's the backlash been like and, and has that been any shunning of you uh not shunning but you know i've had had close friends that i did ministry with for 14 years and uh, you know when i came out publicly with my video uh deconversion video uh close friends that came out with their own videos about me and basically because they knew that i planned on being vocal uh, about my my deconversion and my reasons for deconverting, they told the watching public because you know, an international rap ministry um, with a legacy to this day, they told the public you know the day that I start being vocal about this, the day that I uh, when I become an enemy of the cross, uh, then it's almost like the gloves come off is unfair game. Mm -hmm. uh, so I got people you know who. Uh, I spent 2022 causing a lot of, uh, I guess, unrest on Facebook. I use my Facebook as a place to to unthink my Christian thoughts. And so I just would go on there and just post, you know, 
um, just ways that I'm reorienting my life to rethink things and not think about things from a God-oriented perspective. Um, because I'm I'm sort of an atheist, but I'm sort of not. Like I, I call myself agnostic, right? I'm atheist as it pertains to all revealed religions. I don't think any revealed religion has has any supernatural truth to to any of them. I'm agnostic as to whether or not a God exists, but I think God is an ancient hypothesis that we probably can do better than now. Uh, I think it's an ancient hypothesis that we ought to at least remain open to. We, I mean, we could find a God somewhere um, or gods, who knows? Um, but because we can't rule it out, I won't rule it out. I just think it's very unlikely. And I think, I think we're, we're dooming ourselves to pigeonhole ourselves to what ancient men came up with. Like if they could have looked through a telescope and a microscope the way we can, they would have told different stories. Mm. Yeah. They might have still told stories that but they would have been different ones. They might not have included gods. Um, so anyway, I think agnostic is where I am, where I'm at. But I still, uh, maybe not still. For a while, I was getting you know Christians friends that I did ministry with texting me at two o'clock in the morning, you know, asking me, "Am I sure that I want to take this route? Because if I do, my soul will regret it for eternity." Mm. Um, you know, I'm like, "It's two o'clock in the morning, yo. Like, go to sleep. What are you texting me about this for?" Uh, give me the, trying to give me nightmares like what's, what's what's going on you know the ultimate blackmail <laughs> yeah um it's crazy like but, like you like they can't see you've got all these really good reasons to not believe and they literally want you to check your brain at the door and say i've mm -hmm. got hundreds of and maybe thousands right. at this point of reasons to think this bible is not divine like you you can't you can't make yourself believe something that looks like it's not divine i mean right. it's just how, right. how how do you flip that switch and it's like right. they want you to do it Please flip the switch. Please believe. Like, believe in what? Mythology. It's <laughs> right. clearly mythology. Yeah. Yeah. Can, can I ask on that note about mythology? Did you, do you ever bring that up when you talk to people about the, the reasons you left? Uh, yes, I'm very big on, because I was such a ardent believer in and proclaimer of the 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 bad news that must precede the good news, right? I came up with innumerable analogies to exemplify the fall of man. Medical analogies, law analogies, I mean, you name it. Um, sports analogies, you know, the fall is such a big part of my worldview before my deconversion. And it's so based on Genesis 2 and 3. So a big part of my th thinking myself out of Christianity, and that's probably a sound bite somebody's going to take. See, it was the thinking that did it. Um, but a big part of me uh, uh, undoing the, mind, the mindset that helped me in there was Genesis 2 and 3 explains why we're in the mess that we're in. So I had to go back to uh, the myth of Adapa, and uh, you know that was that was a, a big part of understanding what was happening in Genesis two and three, was looking at how the food of life was used in the myth of Adapa, and who who was responsible for trying to get the man to Adapa to become divine. Um, the serpent in the myth of Adapa was telling the gods, "Hey." When 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 uh, Adapa's God made him, he gave him wisdom. He's almost like us. The only thing he lacks is eternal life. And the serpent pleads to the God, let him get the food of life. He's already got the wisdom like us. Give him the food. He could be eternal. And the God, A, I think, you know, A is the God who made him. The, the other God's about to give Adapa the food of life. Oh, you're right. But Adapa's God, the, Aya, the one who made him, tricked Adapa, saying, when you go there, they're going to offer you the food of death. Don't eat it. Because Adapa's God did not want him to become immortal. Mm. 
which you find all those elements in Genesis two and three. The characters are just, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, the, same the, stuff. The Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim in Genesis two and three does not want Adam and Eve to become immortal. He definitely doesn't want them to become wise. Maybe they can become immortal because the tree of life is there. But once they become wise, now they can't become immortal. Yeah. Not for the reasons that Christians say. It's not, oh, God wanted them to have knowledge, but he didn't want them to get it a sinful way. Or God didn't want to lock them into immortality while they were sinners. The text says nothing about them becoming worse. It says they became wise. And when they became wise, Yahweh Elohim says to someone, the man has become like us. Who are these us's? And there's this fear in like, we don't think about this. There's a fear in the text. He's become like us, knowing both not uh, knowing both good and evil. Now, lest he put forth his hand and eat from the tree of light and live forever. And then the, he doesn't even finish the sentence. It's like, we got to act quick. <laughs> we got to get him the F away from this tree because... He's already too much like us in being wise now. We can't let him be any more like us in becoming eternal. It's too much divine competition. You see the you see two things. You see the mythology and you see the ideology. All they're trying to do is explain, Ag, why does mankind have knowledge of how sucky it is to have to die? <laughs> like, the other animals, as from what we can tell, they live, they die. They don't know how bad a thing that is. We know how good it is to be alive, but now we have to suffer death. And we got to live with that, that juxtaposition. We have this knowledge of good and evil, but we can't be eternal. We come up with the ideology to explain why we can't have both. Why can't we have knowledge and immortality? This myth explains that. That's all it is. You get to... Paul in Romans 5, now this, all of a sudden it's a, it's a huge, oh, sin entered the world and death entered the world. and other, No. So I do try to ex explain to people the way ideology works. Every woman now has birth pain because of what Eve did. Really? You think that's, that's really what, what a, a all-powerful, all-wise, loving God did? Every woman's going to now have pains because of what she did. You don't you don't think that was just a story to explain why why childbirth hurts? You don't think it was that's how ideology works. Mm -hmm. And as simple as death entering the world or or eternal life exiting the world, right? The tree of life, you can't get to it anymore. Um, that's all it is. I could applaud them for just coming up with a story to tell, you know, people, hey, here's why we have to die. You know, somebody messed it up. Uh, the gods didn't want us to have both, you know, eternal life and was, okay, cool story. And you get on with your life. But to go base your life on that, to go on missions trips, you know, telling people these things and risking your life to tell people somebody else's ideology. Like, I pity myself for having lived 30 years that way. And yeah, I do try to try to help people understand that's what you're looking at. That's what you're doing. That's what you're dealing with. I love that you brought up Yahweh because that to me too, that's such a big linchpin in this. I mean, I, I focus a lot of my attention on the New Testament, as I think a lot of us do, but like mm -hmm. Jesus versus Paul and how much Enoch's woven in. But really, you know, Paul and Jesus are both, you know, taking this, picking up the story of, of what Yahweh has been doing in the world. Mm -hmm. And when you get, you say, oh, who is, who, who is Yahweh then? And you're like, okay, <laughs> right. Yahweh, as far as we know, was originally yeah. a son, like one of like 70 sons mm -hmm. of Elyon and Asherah. And then they merge them and then it's Yahweh and Asherah and then they take her out and now it's just Yahweh. It's like, okay, that alone, like if Jesus and Paul are based on Yahweh and Yahweh is that, that alone tells me this is garbage. Yeah. Um, yeah. Regardless of what else you bring into it. Yeah. Um, but then to me, I think just to go back to the mythology issue too, like I feel like the the lack of like the, the poisoning of the well issue, mm -hmm. when you tell people, these other religions, not just current other religions, but the ancient other religions were, were just ways of people saying, we will not bow the knee to the real God, to mm -hmm. Yahweh and Jesus. So you kind of grow up ignoring it. You know, you can sometimes touch a little bit of mythology, but you can't really get neck deep into yeah. it. But like, if you really understood it, and I tell my kids this stuff, I'm like, mm -hmm. do you, and I'll just go through a quick, few quick examples. There's obviously tons, but mm -hmm. like, 
do you know that they used to believe in a God who could turn water into wine? He was the son of a God and mm -hmm. he could turn water into wine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Jesus co comes along hundreds of years later. He does the exact same thing in mm -hmm. his story. Um, the Hermes could walk on water with mm -hmm. his magic slippers and help people. Mm -hmm. Jesus can walk on water. He just doesn't need the magic golden slippers. <laughs> um, Helios, the sun god, he has mm -hmm. a wears a purple robe and he mm -hmm. has the sun behind him like a crown of thorns. Mm -hmm. Jesus, what do they have him wear at the end? A purple <laughs> robe and a crown of thorns. He, you know, in the garden, mm -hmm. uh, he cries tears, which are like drops of blood and water. Well, long before that, they had Zeus, mm -hmm. the high mm -hmm. god, who would cry, cry drops of blood and water. Mm -hmm. And it's like, these people already knew all these motifs. And so right. at that time, when the people of that day would have read the Jesus stories, they would have said, I see what you're doing there. It'd be yeah. like somebody somebody using a motif from Star Wars where they're like, where all of us in this culture pretty much know Star Wars enough to know what's going on. Right. And somebody writes a completely different story where mm -hmm. he talks about a man who has a glowing red stick and mm -hmm. another man has a glowing <laughs> blue stick. Mm -hmm. It's like, I know what you're doing here. Your, your story <laughs> might be very different at that right. point. Right. And you might not be talking about Darth Vader or Luke Skywalker, but you, you're borrowing motifs enough yeah. that I see what you're doing there. And we miss it. We read the Gospels. Yeah. We don't, we completely think it's just this is actual history. Well, see, we, we're missing it. My thing is the people who would say there, there are very many Christians who are getting to the point now. Like I think Michael Jones of Inspiring Philosophy and I have personal friends who do the same thing, who they will admit the motifs. They will admit yeah, they're borrowing. It's a polemic against that culture. They're using the culture's ideas just to say, you know, yeah, we know Darth Vader had the, the red glowing one and uh, the good guy had the, the blue, blue green uh, glowing one and all that. It's not it's not a crime to borrow from those stories because all we're really trying to say is Jesus is the good guy in the story and that sin and Satan is the bad guy. So, yeah, we, we borrow from Star Wars, not because... Star Wars is true, but also he has a good guy and bad guy too. And so there are Christians who want to admit, yes, Genesis borrows from enumeration. Yeah, they, they borrow these motifs, but they change the reason why the God sends the flood and they change the reason. Okay. So they tell me, why are you focusing on the similarities between these myths and the Bible? Focus on the differences. That's what the point is. I would do that, except for the fact that the similarities tells me that this is not real history. Yeah. And if this is not real history, then all you're doing is making claims. And I don't know why I should trust your claims. You can claim the guy in your story is the good guy like Luke was in Star Wars. You can, you can make that. Why, do I, why should I believe that if it's not historical? Yeah. And if you can't and, answer that question for me, why, why are we having this conversation? And if you can, if they can see this list of these other religious beliefs and stories, and you can ask him down the list, like, was Zeus real? No. Mm. Was Hermes mm -hmm. real? No. Was, and you just go, you can go down, you know, dozens and dozens of them. What were all these real? And they did the same things. They cried drops of blood. They had a purple robe and a crown of thorns. Mm. They walked on water, turned water into wine, blah, blah, blah. All they did the same things. Were those stories about Dionysius real and Zeus real? No, the stories weren't real. They weren't real. They're made up. There may have been a kernel where some king, you know, a thousand years mm. earlier was, was, kind of idolized and they made stories about up in the evolved but in terms of the the evolved stories of the zeus character and the dionysius character those stories aren't real the, the the gods aren't real the stories aren't real and then you're like okay well but now you've got you're telling mm -hmm. me jesus is doing the same exact thing what what makes me think that he's real if the, you're going to tell me all these other guys aren't like you can't you can't do that well there's two reasons two ways to get around that one is to say ah no Jesus is the fulfillment of all those, all those, those unreal things. They, they really do happen in him. That's one way to go. The other thing that I, I struggle with this one. Yeah. People like Michael Heiser, you know, he passed away recently. Um, but his idea of the divine council worldview, where he's taking, he's admitting to this idea of there being other gods in the old Testament and a divine council around God and, uh, uh, Deuteronomy 32 being, uh, you know, a council of gods and Psalm, I think it's 84, uh, where God, 82, where God dethrones the other gods. Uh, I'll send you this, this image. I was going to post it on my Facebook, but maybe it'll be good to post it here. Yeah. Um, people in, in Michael Heiser's Facebook group, because they're taking their cue from him, they would, they wouldn't say, 
Hermes isn't real, Osiris isn't real, Zeus isn't real, but Jesus is. They would say, oh no, all of them are real gods. They're all real. Zeus is a real God. These are all the other gods that were being referred to in the Old Testament when, when God says to the other gods, I say ye are gods, but you'll die like men. These are all real gods that God had to dethrone because they weren't ruling properly. And now they become these, these lower, like, like demonic gods that Zeus is still a real God. So now you, like Christians are having to say, no, no, they're, they're all real. And I'm sitting there looking like this, like, okay, where does it stop? Like you're, you have the some, some Christians who would deny the other mythology, but the Bible is true. Then the other side of the spectrum is no, we accept it all. It's all true. Yeah. It's just that the God of the Bible is the real God, the, the, the high God, all these other gods are now his, his foes. And the weird thing is though, either way, when you, and I know we're sidetracking here, I'll get back to your story in a second, but the, the weird thing about that is either way, mm. you end up with a God that you, that's not worthy of worship. I mean, you, you end up exactly. whether you think he's, he's <laughs> exactly. the, like a henoth, I think it's called a henotheism where he's a high God among many, mm -hmm. or it's just, it's always been monotheism, whichever one you take. Yahweh is a God who clearly commands genocide, land theft, slavery, mm -hmm. stoning, child brides. He commands you, you can take mm -hmm. slaves and, and make them sex slaves. And if mm -hmm. you want to keep them, keep them. If you don't send them away, mm -hmm. um, an endless stuff where yeah. it's just like this God <laughs> is horrific. And yeah. the whole message of, I love you so much, but if you don't love me back, I will mm. slaughter you. I mean, like he's this absolute <laughs> psychopath character, mm. um, and he demands blood. Like, why can't he just say, "I forgive you"? Like, what? Like, what does blood have to have? <laughs> why do we have to have blood? We don't. We don't. Like, I wish Christians could get it. Blood mm. is not important at all in our worldview. It's important to our bodies, obviously, to work. Mm. But our worldview, blood is blood magic is not a thing. Mm. It's just it's just magic thinking. And yeah. you got this psychopath God. Um, either way, whether he beat the tarnation out of everybody else to get there, or he's just always been the only one with these, you know, maybe admitting lesser demons and stuff, lesser angels. Either way, he's a bad God. Like, yeah. you, did you ever get to that point where you're like, if he's real, I don't want him to be real, you know? Only after the conversion, yes. So the problem of evil was never a problem for me. Okay. Even to this day, it's just now becoming a problem for me. Um, Like, I, I spend, I spend, too much time online watching animals you know i'm i'm amazed by cats i mean uh, uh, you know videos of yeah cats and dogs loving each other dogs and birds becoming best friends leopards and deer you know like growing up together i'm like wow but i'm also equally fascinated by eagles snatching uh, you know, dogs up and, 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 you know, tearing them apart and bears ripping apart, you know, other end. I'm like. And snakes eating things of, alive. Yeah. But I, I'm looking at this and I'm like, man, so this natural, we would call that natural evil, right? Uh, this natural pain and suffering. Like God designed that, like, you know, these animals clearly seek to evade and avoid the pain of being devoured by another animal. God designed that to, you know, like why couldn't we just get the energy we need from the sun, like plants? Why do we have to consume other, why do we, God designed it to be this way? Yeah. And you have the people say, no, that happened after the fall. And you look at the fossil record and like, way before mankind is on the scene, Animals are killing and eating animals. You know, they're fossilized in the process of eating each other. Um, mm. Like, so. Yeah, if God designed that, he did a terrible job. Yeah, he's he's somehow getting glory and pleasure from the suffering and pain of animals, number one. And then look at the pain and suffering of humanity. Even if it's not things that sin calls, just natural disasters, you know, just sinkholes and tsunamis and like i think now more than ever the problem of evil has become an issue for me uh when before i would just chalk it up to a fallen world this is a fallen world adam introduced chaos into the picture you know uh the earth is groaning for the revelation of the sons of god you know he's going to make it all right one day but we we, we messed it up not him um we're actually doing an episode on my podcast 
uh, we're going to record it tonight, actually. Um, but we're doing a, <laughs> we're putting Yahweh on trial. It's a RICO trial. Um, and we're looking at all the things that are said that have been done by Satan or humans that God is really standing behind as sort of this mob boss giving the green light, you know, for this hit or that, like you said, the genocides or the rape, or whatever. Um, yeah, evil is a much bigger problem for me now than it was before. Yeah. Well, I know I've kept it for a while, but I do want to kind of throw in one final topic and I might mm -hmm. throw in a few little questions, but just call it a topic for now. What, what now? Like once, mm -hmm. once you've spent your life up to that point in 2021, dedicated to the Bible and the gospel, the Lord Jesus Christ, the kingdom, getting mm -hmm. as many people saved as you can mm -hmm. and living your life for God's glory. Once you get to a point where you realize this is mythology, this is uh, like you talked about just ancient men coming up with stuff mm. and it has nothing to do with real life. It has nothing to do with our lives. It, it shouldn't have anything to do with our lives. And you finally escaped it. Mm -hmm. um, in my words, you, you won the lottery. Um, you, <laughs> right. you, you, may, you may or may not have physical money, but you, you, you won the mm. lottery. You got your life back a little bit. Mm. But at that point, you're at the same time also doing a couple of things. You're reclaiming your identity. Yeah. Uh, or figuring out what your identity yeah, even is. Exactly. And you're also figuring out what do I do now with the rest of my life? Because yeah. it's different. And I don't even know if if you have to have a meaning. Like, do I even is it worth saying what's the my life about? Yeah. Or is you know, how do you Great deal question. with that? And yeah. What is so what is what is Brady's the rest of his life gonna be about? I'm gonna assume the best you're gonna live a long life. <laughs> yeah. How are you gonna use it? And what when yeah. why? Great question, man. I, I've got to the point where I no longer look at life as having purpose. I look at life as having potential. And I'm committed to, uh, I wouldn't say necessarily maximizing my potential, but actualizing uh, as many potentialities as uh, as I, I deem fit. Um, and so a lot of my time the last couple of years has been having conversations with people about uh, the Bible, about deconversion, uh, up until this year, so we're in 2023 now. I spent most of 2022. I could I could probably count on these hands and maybe one foot. If I use a couple toes. The number of days in 2022 that I was not having a lengthy face to face text Zoom conversation with somebody about their possible deconversion hmm. the entire year all year awesome. um and the thing about it is it never drains me it never drains me just like i as a christian i can do the same thing given the gospel i'm just as invigorated because to me it's the same pursuit it's the pursuit of truth hmm. the same mission i was exactly. on is the same mission i'm on now and even if we can't get to, man, what is the ultimate reality? We can at least get far away from falsehood. And so I'm dedicated to that. And once again, not because I feel the sense of purpose. It's one of my potentialities. Like that's something that I can do and I enjoy doing it. Um, so I wrote the book to lay out my reasons for deconversion. I started the podcast, Ikapod, uh, where me and some friends are basically thinking through I really wanted to call the podcast Life After Faith. And it's really our thought life after faith. Like these are the ways that we look back at the faith we once held now that we're out, uh, hopefully to help other people uh, think through some of the things that kind of can hold you in bondage uh, to, 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 the, to the faith or a faith. Um, making up for a lot of lost time. You know what I mean? Like uh, <laughs> I've never married. And one of the reasons I never married was because I wanted to be so committed to ministry that I was always worried about marrying somebody who would take me away from the, from the mission field. So mm -hmm. I've always dated. I came close to proposing a couple of times, but I always had this sense of, ah, uh, is this person going to be fit for ministry? And so as, as sad as that is, uh, there's several loves that I had that I'm like, man, I, 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 I could have been with this person. I could have been with that person. But so I'd have to say making up for lost time in the area of just having relationships. And um, I don't know how PG or R this uh, this podcast needs to be, but uh, PG-13. PG-13. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
yeah, I, I, maybe I'll share some things after we, you know, end the podcast, but I'm just making it for lost time. There's a lot of life that I'm like, hey, there, there, there are parts of life that I, I didn't get to live that I'm I'm just enjoying living now, uh, human parts of life. Um, if you were to marry, how yeah. would your deconversion affect how you raise children? Wow, great question. Um, I think one of the things that we as a society will probably do as more and more people deconvert is talk about ways to achieve, understand first, and then achieve morality without relying on religious ideology. Mm. Um, And so I think one of the things that would happen in in child bearing and child rearing is uh, being able to implement humanism as a foundation for ethics. Mm-hmm. And not being afraid or ashamed or embarrassed or you know to do so. Um, so I think that's probably one of the chief ways that my deconversion would play into you know raising the next generation. Mm, that's awesome. I'll just piggyback on that from from my side too. One of the biggest things is is thought uh, <clears throat> excuse me thought autonomy, mm-hmm. where you're just telling people like you don't have to believe mm-hmm. you you can do the research, kind of like what you did in your story. Like you don't have to be like your mom or your dad or the preacher you can be mm. like you know whatever you want yeah just like we would say you know you don't have to get a hug from somebody it's your body you mm. don't have to believe such and such because it's your mind yeah and and really to empower people just to say about that like, <laughs> you who, i love doing with my kids i'll be like who has the power over what you believe and they mm. know the answer is like i do i get that <laughs> and i'm like you know you empower them and they 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 get it they really do get it it's, it's such That's a great. privilege um do you Do you feel like, and I'll make this my last question, do you feel like there's any chance that your music will play a part in Mm. what you do going forward with your, what you're doing in the podcast and so forth, but just your general efforts to Mm -hmm. share what you've learned, to share your Mm. journey? Do you think music will ever come back into it or is that more on the back burner for now? Yeah, there's several reasons why I don't think it ever will. Um, One, because it was such a part of my Christian life that it almost feels like I used the the analogy before, but thinking about rapping about not the gospel almost feels like taking my new girlfriend to me and my old girlfriend's favorite restaurant Hmm. because the gospel was me and God's thing. (laughs) You know what I mean? Um, So it's hard to think about doing music for not the gospel or for anti-gospel purposes. Um, If I was just to rap about life, maybe, Um, I don't know. But also another thing is I look at what's happened to rap music and I don't want to say there's a degradation because I do think there are people who still manage to to do the things that I like, but I was a very intentional lyricist and I put a lot of time into putting words together, words and ideas. And I kind of got the impression a while ago that people aren't really checking for that. It's a lot of work for a very little payoff if people want easy listening as opposed to uh, complex lyricism. And so I'm just like, eh, I don't need to do it anymore. And if it's not going to be that, if it's not going to be as rewarding for the listener or for me as the artist just to be appreciated, I don't want to put that kind of time in. So uh, at this point, I just feel like it's it's a lot of effort for not a lot of payoff. Um, I don't know if it'll remain that way. I heard an artist last night, I forget who it was, that kind of got me a little excited. Oh, I could, that might make me want to get back in the ring. Uh, but I don't know if that's just like, you know, the old guy at a basketball game who used to play like, oh, I want to get back out there with these young guys. You really can't, it's, you know. You don't have the knees for it anymore. Uh, I don't know if I have the the lyrical knees. I don't know. We'll see. Well, I'm going to cast my vote, and I'm going to keep my fingers crossed that at some point it comes back into play. Because I've learned, I've always dreamt of being a musician myself, and mm. I just don't have the background for it per se. But I think it's one of the, just being able to bring truth on the level where people's mm. emotions are. And yeah. a lot of people they're not going to listen to a serious conversation necessarily mm. all the time. They'll put it on, then they'll flip back to something entertaining. But they'll put music on in the background, and it you know it gets in your head and your in your heart, so to speak. And I'm just gonna say I'll keep my fingers crossed. You, 
you do get back into it, I think your skills are amazing and I'd love to see you use them to uh appreciate that. You know, hit people's emotions that way. But um I know we've gone a long time, but Brady, thank you so much. Um this has been awesome to get to know you and to hear your story. Yeah. I really appreciate you keep doing a public excuse me. I appreciate the fact that you went the route of a public platform. I know some people mm -hmm. have good reasons to not go public. I appreciate the fact that you were able to and willing to speak up. So thank you so much. Yeah. Uh it's a pleasure. Uh, I, once again, I appreciate this platform, and uh, I'm like, hey, let's just be human. Let's let's just do that and see how far uh, that gets us. And let's let's be better humans. Uh, you know, let's let's create the kind of world that we want to live in. I'm here for that effort, and uh, yeah, man, let's keep it going. <laughs> good good thoughts. Well, everyone, we've been speaking to Brady Fanatic Goodwin, and I'll have some links beneath our video for everyone to go check out his stuff. But Brady, thank you so much. Great to hear your story, and we look forward to what's next. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right.